Anybody else have any guide sightings? Arturo, glad you're here. Can't hear you, Arturo. Yeah, you're on now. Oh. Can't, can't hear you. I got this new mic. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, you're good. You're, good you're now. okay now. It's quite a big one. Take a look at it. It's pretty big. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a monster mic, right? <laughs> what are you doing with that thing, Arturo? Like you're I'm, gonna start, uh, I'm gonna start doing like uh like YouTube stuff. So I figured I'd go big or go home, right? So <laughs> 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 it's so good to see you guys. I'm so used to see you guys on Shabbat, so I thought I'd make this time early this morning to good, good, jump all you guys for sure. So Shabbat, well, Shalom, I should say. Shalom. Shabbat's over, but you know, good morning. Fantastic. All right, you got a Rush Limbaugh microphone there. Exactly. Excellence and bright. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Me. Yes, Alita. Yeah, yesterday um, I ended up getting a ride down to um, the memorial. Some of the other women that were going to go down and help with some of the things live up here near me. So I, and, and earlier in the week, one of my eyes has felt especially dry and just kind of irritated. So that long drive, the blessing of having, being able to jump in a car and let somebody else drive was one thing, not using gas, you know, all those things. So it's like, it was such a plus to be able to, to be driven down there. That's your shoe and tell them we're busy. Go ahead. So I got down there, I got down there early because those people were going to help with some of the stuff and I didn't know that's what they were doing. So I'm like, okay, Lord, I, you know, ugh. you know, it's like, I, and I wore a different shoes because I thought, well, I'm just going to go and sit. And it's like, no, now you're going to help. <laughs> so got a chance to go there and it was such a blessing. It was like, we got a chance to stand by the, the book, the guest book. Mm -hmm. So encouraging people to sign in because remembering from funeral, family funerals, it really is a blessing to go back and flip through and see who was there. Because during the yeah. event, you're in a you're in a zone. You really don't even remember who's there. So mm -hmm. it was a blessing to do that. And partner in crime, Diane got a chance to hand out. I said, "Did you tell him about Billy's rules, Diane?" Yeah. <laughs> so I let her tell you about Billy's rules because that was a blessing too. Just the the little thing that was there. It encouraged so many people, but. <laughs> getting a chance to be there, getting a chance to serve. So I felt useful. And then at the reception, yes, it was, there were so many people that had helped me throughout the year that I wanted to write thank you notes to. And I'm really not good at that. I just, the first ones I ever wrote were graduation gifts. My mom then said, that's what you do. <laughs> so it's, it's not in my nature to write the cards, but it's in my nature to hug and tell you. So person by person that came in just to bless Denise, I had the opportunity to turn around to them and go, thank you for when you helped me when, when my brother, yeah. when my this, you know, so I got a chance to do the in-person thank you. And my, I feel 10 pounds lighter because of just being able to get those out. So I'm like, Lord, you brought them to me. You, you made it, you, you did it the way I'm comfortable doing it. You know, and then I could see their faces when I said thank you. You know, so what a blessing. What a blessing. Man. Mm -hmm. so, so thank, thank you for that. Uh -huh. So Diane has to tell you about Billy's rules. That was fun. Billy's rules. Oh. Billy had, Billy, he had a, a great outlook on life. And um, Paula Pinto put these things together yesterday that had one of those little miniature Hershey's bars and she taped them to these um, these little things that have Billy's rules on them and Billy's rules the first one is don't cry if you cry you can't have fun the second one is don't cry even if you're sad the third one is candy is always a yes and then don't ever tell your mom what we do. <laughs> and the last one was no diapers. He won't be changing you. But it's a based, based it, everything on 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12. 
and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win, <clears throat> may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And he was just one of the servants with a real, a true servant heart that was always in the background and never would take any credit for anything. Right. He did everything for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And that was his life verse. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah, that was Billy in a nutshell. Yeah, absolutely. Praise God. Well, let's pray. How about we just come before you right now? We lift you up and we thank you. Lord, uh, Lord, just help us to see in the course of any given week uh, where you show up. Uh, again, to quote my friend Henry Blackaby, find out where the, the Lord is at work and join him in that work. So we just praise you and thank you. Keep our eyes open all the time, Lord. Give us a 360-degree panorama so that we can see where you work and be able to join in that work in whatever capacity we can. So we praise you. We thank you. Lord, we just thank you right now for your Ruah, for your spirit showing up right here, right now, Lord, this morning. We thank you for those who decided to join us here. And Lord, we lift you up and exalt you. Be with us as we break open your word, Lord. In Yeshua's precious name, amen, amen, and amen. Amen. So uh, just, uh, just as a reminder, you know, we're in that period of the counting of the Omer. That 49 days uh, after the uh, start of Passover uh, that leads up to what's called Shavuot. Shavuot. And uh, so take a pencil and, and a paper right now. Okay. And uh, write down for me what is Shavuot? Pentecost. Oh, write it down. You did. You did. And she just said it. No, you shouldn't say it. Oh, <laughs> Aside from, yes, a lot of people know it as Pentecost. Okay. And what happened on Pentecost? The Ten Commandments were given. The Ten Commandments. Okay. So it, it was the giving of the commandments on, on Zion. Okay. But it's also the giving of the Ruach. Holy Spirit. Okay. Ruach. The Ruach. Amen. Ruach HaKodesh. Oh Holy Spirit. Praise God. Okay, so, so we count 49 days. That's the counting of the Omer. And so in the middle of that, we are in preparation and looking forward to that as a commemoration of the giving of the Spirit, which happens on Shavuot, which is coming, uh, I think, the 1st of June. So, um, and during that time, there's a prayer that's offered up that says, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam. Blessed art thou, O Lord, thy God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments concerning the counting of the Omer. Okay, and so what's an Omer? I don't know. Anybody have any idea? I think so. Time. Time. Preparation. Well, no, it's an actual physical thing. An Omer. Yeah, it's in a bunch of. It's a bushel. Bushel. It's like a bushel. A bushel? In the bushel, but probably the wheat or the tares. Oh, the tares. Yeah. Okay, the, the barley, which was in fact back then their first fruits of, uh, of Jerusalem. Okay, so this week the parasha is Behukotai. Okay, and we're in Leviticus 26, 3. Behukotai. And if you read the very first line, you'll know what that means. 26, 3. What does it say? Very first line. Michael, you know, what does it say on the very first line? I'm sorry. I what are you looking at? What um, Buhu Kotai, again, the name of the parasha is always taken from something in the very first line of the reading. Okay, so what does it say? I'm on the 
wrong page. Sorry. I see it. Yes. See it. Um, it says faithfulness ensures blessings. Okay. The very first line, though, 26 3 says what? If you if walk, you walk in, my in my statutes. statutes. In my statutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what the definition is. In my statutes. So, okay. again, uh, this is the last parish on Leviticus. Okay. And um, some of you are going, oh, thank God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Leviticus is not easy because. It's shucking it down to the cop. It really makes it very clear. You do this or you do that or you don't do this. And nothing makes it clearer than what's going on in this particular parish shop. Okay, yeah. it says- I've been, been enjoying uh, Leviticus actually. Well, amen, yeah, amen. But again, unless you read it with a Holy Spirit perspective, because if somebody says, oh, you know, join our, our Bible study where we're in Leviticus. <laughs> Yeah, normally, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Leviticus 3, 4, again, uh, this is, it says there in that, that verse, it says, if you follow my decrees in Hebrew, and are careful to obey my commandments, mitzvot, I will send you rain in its season and ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. What a deal, okay? You follow me, I provide for you, okay? Such a deal. So in Bahar, which was the last thing that we read last week, it instructs us about, you remember the section about Shemitah? Okay, the land has to lay fallow. It's the Sabbath for the land every seventh year. And about Yovel, anybody remember what Yovel is? That is Jubilee. Jubilee, all right, Arturo, thank you. Okay, so we were also instructed about the Sabbaths and about the reverence for the sanctuary itself. But this week, Adonai promises the people that they will be blessed, enjoying the prosperity and security in the Holy Land if those tiny little words make such an important message. If they keep his statutes and commandments, he also warns that if they reject Torah, and abandon his covenant, that they will be cursed. If then, if then, simple. Okay, that's what is called tochaka, tochaka, which means re rebuff or rebuke or reproof or warning. Okay, somebody have a hand up? Okay, uh, tochaka, T-O-C-H-A-C-H-A in Hebrew. Re rebuke or reproof. One more time. Tohaka. Tohaka. T O C H A C H A. Tohaka. Okay, the paragraph begins with the blessings that if we are in fact obedient to him, it says the first of God's promises is seasonable rain in the land. It will send you rain in season and the ground will yield its crops and the trees will have their fruit. And as, as it says in Ecclesiastes, it reminds us that there is a time for every season, for everything. And God also promises that the they keep that they keep His commandments, His Torah. And again, reminding, yes, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are Torah as we know it. But the entire Word of God, Genesis to Revelation, is Torah. Revelation. Okay, it's all his instruction. It is a love letter to us. Amen. So he says that if you keep Torah, then they will live in peace in their land. They will chase their enemies who will fall before them. I will grant you peace in the land and you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. You will pursue your enemies and they will fall by the sword before you. And this is rather comforting. And the blessing concludes with God's promise to have this kind of reciprocal relationship with us so that we will be, in fact, his people. And if they walk in his ways, then he will accept them as his people and he will put his tabernacle among them and walk in their midst. And that's what that Mishkan, that tabernacle was. 
that was established in the desert. Question, Chuck. Uh, this morning, uh, so I had something happen that uh, I think has to do with what we're reading and what we're sharing right here. Um, we have company coming, a girl named Diane Donahue, who used to be in our Sunday school class 30 years ago at First Baptist. Anyway, so I'm vacuuming a little oriental rug. And as I'm vacuuming this little oriental rug uh, in our living room, <clears throat> God speaks to me. And, and it, what the word was this? I don't want perfection from you, and you're not going to get perfection from this oriental rug. But I do want I do want you to grow, and I do want you to know. And how it related to me, both in the Old and the New Testament, in the Old Testament, of course, Yom Kippur, God gave us Yom Kippur uh, to the Jews because they were going to fall short. And he didn't want them to carry that around every single day for the rest of their lives. So they have a, an annual way to uh, have their sins atoned for. And in the New Testament, what he reminded me was, I've begun a good work in you. I'm going to continue it until completion. And then he gives us 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The reason that I'm tying it all together is that I believe God knows our hearts, and that's what he looks at more than anything. And if he gives us his decrees, he wants them to be a priority. He wants, he wants us to live that um, life that desires to live God's will. And I think that's exactly what he's telling us, don't you? Amen. Precisely. He's just making it, as, as I like to say, he's shucking it down to the cob right here. Okay, if and then. And again, as you said, he gave the Jews Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and all the other feasts for the purposes of passing it along to everybody else. It wasn't just for the Jews. He gave it to them to give to the world. So uh, again, that was the whole, the whole purpose in that. But he wants to tabernacle with everybody. So that's why, again, when he built the tabernacle in the desert, he wanted to dwell among them. Amen. And on a lighter note, he speaks to us through Hoover vacuum cleaners and Dyson and every other thing. <laughs> Since you were vacuuming the rug, right? Chuck? Any way he can to get your attention. Okay. He said in Leviticus 12, 26, 12, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. Amen. So if you are obedient and walk, that's halat, Hebrew, in my ways, hukot, C-H-U-K-K-O-T, hukot. He gives like 13 blessings that ends with a, a curious reminder that God set the Israelites free from bondage in Egypt and from slavery. And in Leviticus 26, 13, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you could no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. Amen? Amen. So you are completely free and lift it up to do exactly what you had to do. Myrna, good morning. Do you have a question? You're muted, Myrna. You're muted. Thank you. Good morning and blessings. Yes, I was thinking just now that um, we have no problem in, in copying, imitating attitudes and cooking um, recipes and hairstyles and clothing and, and how we express love. But we have a problem that God gave, selected one of his people to show us he's, Christ came and he also has a Jewish people that he said he wanted them, not because they were especially good or anything, but because he chose them, that they would be um, examples of how he is showing his love, his kindness, his forgiveness. I mean, why don't we copy him? You know, today I just made a box of um, oregano and um, a group from Orleans, New Orleans came by to minister in the area. And it was, this morning I got up and I made a box of 10 plants and it could be double and took it over to them, thanking them as they go by, go plant in New Orleans. And they were grateful for that. We can and we should and we must 
open up to people. They will say it's a Jewish holiday. It is the listen. I am also a Jew. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Myrna. God bless you. Thank you. Did you have something? Dr. Yeah, okay. uh, well, I only, I, I, how much praise and how much worship and how much obedience is enough for this wonderful king that we have that has provided for us in such a wonderful way? I just love to think about what you're talking about right now. That wonderful king that we have who deserves that obedience and praise and worship. And we fall short, but you know what? He doesn't want to beat us up for falling short. He wants us to learn from falling short. He doesn't want, he wants us to learn and then be better. That's what I learned in beckoning this rug. You know, you're never going to get it perfect, but you know what? Just keep going in the right direction. Keep seeking me and I'm going to keep working in your life. And hi to Susan. It's been a long time. Susan, Chrissy was asking about you. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to the rug again. I, you just reminded me of something. My mother, being old school Italian, uh, when she vacuumed the rugs, uh, and she taught us about vacuuming the rugs, she didn't want to see the line. She wanted it always perfect. She didn't want to see that line in the rug, and just goes with what you were saying. I, I told a story yesterday in synagogue, a joke, and what you're just talking about kind of reminds me of that. I mentioned it to Susan yesterday, but uh, a minister and a priest and a rabbit go into the blood bank. Did you hear this? Did you hear this already? Yeah, Jeff is laughing. He knows you're going to be funny. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, start again. No, none of the people we explain to who we, we meet with three times a week understand that how funny rabbis can be. So that, that's, the, <laughs> that's what I'm laughing at. Good material. <laughs> Maybe you emphasize the T. So again, the minister, the priest, and the rabbit go into the blood bank. And the blood bank says to the rabbit, you know, why are you here? And he said, I must be a typo. Exactly. <laughs> typo. Get yeah. it? Because it was a rabbit. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Moving right along. <laughs> more coffee. They need more coffee. That's all. It's more not coffee. you, Rabbi. It's you. not it's you, it's Rabbi. They just need more it's coffee. Brewing. It's, it's brewing. Right. That's the book of Hebrews. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Can I say oh. that one more thing? Oh, boy. Yes. In regard to what the other sister said about being a Jew, when we look at um, Romans 2, um, especially 28 to 29, out of the TLV, it says, For one is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision something visible in the flesh. Rather, the Jew is one inwardly, and the circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, not in letter. His Amen. praise is not from men, but from God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Thank you for that, Bo. Okay, appreciate that. So, we understand from the verse, God, who enabled the Israelites to walk up really rightly by revealing himself to them and setting them free from slavery. And it is only within this covenant relationship that they would walk in his ways. The verb walking and keeping in this week's Torah portion simply implies that it comes from a deliberate action on our part. Amen? So nevertheless, keeping his commandments is only possible because he set us free. That's a good place to say amen. 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 <laughs> How great is it to claim the blessings of God? However, these promises are conditional upon our obedience. And it is completely futile to walk in disobedience and still claim the blessings that result from our relationship with him. Amen? Amen. So conversely, in this same section, he speaks about the consequences that if we are disobedient or all of those things dwarf 
what it says about being obedient. It says, I will bring, listen, please. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seeds in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. Ugly. So despite this very painful description of severe punishment and terrible calamities that would come on Israel for being disobedient, God ends up with a word of comfort and consolation here. Okay, he said, in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I uh, so, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. He said, I will remember them, for, uh, remember the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am. And as we recite, in the liturgy in the course of our service, where it says in Jeremiah, God promises through uh, a new covenant, a brit hadashah, in which the law of God would be written on their heart. Obviously, Jeremiah 31, 31. If the, he says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make for the house of Israel and the house of Judah a new covenant. I it will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. So he says in the Tanakh, in the older covenant, the older testament, I hate to say old because it was never old. But when I made their ancestors, he said in the old testament, that there's going to be a new one. It makes it very clear. Okay, because I, they broke my covenant, even though I was like a husband to them. So the new covenant is sealed in the blood of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. And so when he died on the Roman execution stake, it was sealed. And on the Passover, less than a day before his death, Yeshua held up the cup of redemption. That's what we talk about at the Passover. Okay, Yeshua held up the cup of redemption. This is from the book of Luke. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That's a good place to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Romans 8, 38, 39, Rav Shaul, otherwise known as Paul, says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Messiah Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Any questions about that? Okay. By the way, uh, as we uh, segue into Thessalonians, I missed a week. Okay, I don't know if you're aware of that. Apologize. I apologize that, but we are now in the section that's called encouraged. Okay, uh, this is First Thessalonians 3, verses 4 through 13. Does everybody have that? Okay, Mary... Uh, Sternberg sent, sends out the message every week. Okay, everybody's got it. Praise God. Okay. Susan, can I briefly backtrack? Um, I find the Lord so stunning in, in what you're sharing and in what he has done that the fulfillment of Yeshua and the embracing of us through that to give us the confidence by looking at him 
And because we have that confidence, we don't fear, but we, are, we have the awe of being able to stand sort of between two worlds and to be able to be seated together with him in heavenly places, accepted in, in the beloved, not in ourselves, right? But accepted in the beloved so that we can receive correction, so that we can walk out of the finished race to be continuously learning as sons, right? We are his Talmudim in that we are not just students, but we are family. And that amazing place that he positions us by virtue of the cross, by virtue of the sacrifice and then being our priest always puts me in such a place of it's so stunning to me or on the verge of not being able to speak which as you well know i never quite get there <laughs> hallelujah oh. Oh, praise god absolutely yeah. I enjoy the perspective. Yes, Chuck. Well, on that on that note, I, I just believe that uh, we we put a lot or, or the world wants to put a lot of weight on our shoulders with regards to uh, perfecting. Chrissy, someone's at the door. I mean, they have to hold that. I'll, I'll come back to it in one second. Okay. No problem. All right. All right, so again, uh, we're in 1 Thessalonians uh, 3, 4 through 13. Um, the title of the section is Encouraged. And um, seeing, as we've all been talked about and we share when we're talking with other people, that seeing changed lives encourages distressed hearts. Amen? When, when we were talking earlier about, you know, asking somebody if you can pray for them, that in itself is an encouragement. Amen? So um, in this section, there's a memory verse, 1 Thessalonians 3.12. If somebody would like to hop over there, 1 Thessalonians 3.12 and read it for us, please. Mike? I've got it. All right, nice and loud. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Nice. Just as we do to you. Amen. All right. Chuck, did you want to pick that up where you were? Um, yeah, if you don't mind. Um, I don't but... mind. My mind is a little distracted now. Uh, we have a couple of Diane Donahue, that girl who was in our Sunday school class, just arrived at our house. So, any relation to Tim Donahue or Donahue? No, no, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, to me, uh, what Susan brought up and uh, uh, it just ties it really all together. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't want to dwell on the fact that we are a work in progress, but. You know, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, he, when he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing, and do not conform any longer to the ways of this world. Uh, those things are, are urging us as we go forward and to what we're talking about here and what Susan brought up. Uh, the wonderful thing is God wants to be our manager. And just like any job that we might take, in the beginning, the manager has to tell us everything. We don't know anything. And then along the way, as the Lord of our lives, we start to learn some things that we take to heart and really apply to our lives. But the job's not over. We're in the family business. And the family business is very so multifaceted 
uh, we may all have our part, our little part, but even our little part is multifaceted. So he's, he continues to do these wonderful things through his word to encourage us to a life of, you know, like Jesus, holiness and that type of thing. And the main goal uh, right now is to bring others into the family. Uh, we're in the family. We have the great victory. Uh, that's, that's a guarantee. And that's what I think Susan brought up is this confidence that we should have waking up, going to sleep, living the course of the day. I may make mistakes along the way, but I'm in the family. My father is almighty God. The Holy Spirit has, he has decided to allow him to dwell in me, to guide me, uh, you know, over my own stumbling, you know, uh, and to continue to build us up. Uh, I'll, I'll end with that, but I just, you know, to me, God is so good to us. I don't know. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, so in this study. Um, please note, you're getting literally, and I hope you come here with pen and pencil, okay? Because in the study, I want you to note the emotions that Paul expresses as we read. Um, and maybe you could literally make a list of um, his concerns and his feelings, okay? In this, in this study that we're reading. So one of the uh, key doctrines that we're talking about here is that this new covenant church of Yeshua is an autonomous local congregation uh, of baptized believers and associated by covenant in the faith and the fellowship through Besorah, through the gospel, good news. Amen. Amen. So would you turn please to Acts 2. Acts 2, verses 41 and 42. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Acts 2, verses 41 and 42. First one there I like to read. The fellowship, yeah. They gathered together. Go ahead, Myrna. No, I haven't found it yet. I just know it. <laughs> and the believers. <laughs> and I don't want to misquote it. That's all right. <laughs> so you said Acts 2 and 40. 2, 41 and 42. Okay. So those who received this his message were immersed. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added. Right place? Yeah. Okay. They were devoting themselves to the teaching of the emissaries and to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayers. Amen. That's 2, 41 and 42, right? Right. Okay, amen. All right, now turn with me. So we're talking about that fellowship, and they were devoted themselves. Bo, did you want to say something? I just wanted to ask, what's the difference between, why does it say emissaries and not disciples? Are they the same? Yeah. yeah. And again, Talmudim is the direct translation of his students. Okay. Talmudim. Okay. His disciples. Same thing. Okay. okay. But people who are, in fact, emissaries, what translation were you reading, Kalita? TLV. TLV. And I was wondering about emissaries as well. This is the first time I heard them. The well, first that, time I what, remember seeing it. What's an emissary? But that it's. It, Part of me felt like somebody who was sent out to take a message. <laughs> I guess it's just, you know, same thing. Same thing. Every, everybody's sitting here. <laughs> okay. We are his emissaries. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. This all has to do with fellowship and faith in the gospel, in the Bessorah. Who's got it? I have that one too, but I have a question. But okay, so to 
1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, to God's community in Corinth, having been made holy in Messiah Yeshua, called as Kedashim, with all who everywhere call on the name of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, both theirs and ours. Kedashim is what? That's my question. <laughs> holy, holy ones? ones? Is that holy ones? Holy. Holy. Okay. Oh. We, we say Kadosh. Is holy kadoshim or the I am makes it plural. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Kadoshim, the, the holy ones. Mm. So read. Can you read one more time, Kalita? Mm -hmm. To God's community in Corinth, having been made holy in Messiah Yeshua, called kadoshim, with all who everywhere call on the name of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. Both theirs and ours. Amen. So what are we right here? We are his community. Amen. This okay. is our little Chavorah, our meeting. We are all Talmudim, his students. That's what we're doing right now. The deeper we understand, the more we read, the more we ask him to impart discernment to us. Amen. Because we all have a purpose and we are to be his disciples, his emissaries. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, again, most of us probably are glad that um, we do not know parents endured when they were trying to raise us. <laughs> when you think back, okay, I remember some very clear moments when I was perhaps a challenge to my parents. Hmm. But no doubt we caused them stress and sleepless nights along the way. I can't imagine. Mm. Parenting <laughs> is not for the weak at heart. Parents feel distress for those whom they love unconditionally, hoping that their warnings will be heeded. The church at Thessalonica was like a child to Paul. And we see him experience the thoughts and the feelings of a parent with this church. In the process, both were encouraged through the faithfulness of the other. Amen. So Paul was faithful to them. They were faithful to Paul because they got the good news. They got it. Okay. So, Myrna, yes. Yes. Um, since Thursday, I have a new and deepened understanding about presenting the gospel to persons whom who the Lord has sent us and just just don't stop because not every day we have the privilege of being able to hear a sound and it becomes a word or a statement my friend and I he's who have been, we have been praying for we went on Thursday to be checked out for um, hearing aid but when the test was done, of course, confirmed that her left ear had zero ability to hear. But the right ear, which she thought had some, it has the ability to hear sound, but not to make sense of what is said. Can't make sense. And there is nothing but perhaps a surgery at 81 won't be um, done. Bypass the ear and go to the brain direct. Wow. It was a shocker to me. And I resolved, and I thank God for having me to hear that because there is no time like now. If Hazel did not hear the word of God and was transformed and being transformed, there is only the Lord himself as usual would be um, helping her to hear because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And What's so this? we pray for God's wisdom to be filtered out to the um, audiologists and all those who he would send us to, but just to know the urgency of telling the good news now, now, now. Wow. Oh Lord, we thank you for your help. 
right now, Lord. Thank you for the ears that hear and the eyes that see and will go forth and tell so that others may come into the family. Amen. 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 Going along with that, Myrna, it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, several times this past uh, couple of weeks, it's been, brought, it's been brought to my attention that when the body starts to shut down, uh, what, whatever the situation may be, and in particular, this was um, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, that type of uh, uh, problem. But it was brought to my attention several times that hearing is the last thing to go. That's why it's so important to, yeah. yes, share with people and even those that are very sick and that you think are not hearing you when you're by their bedside, they're hearing you. Mm -hmm. That is the, one of the last things to go. So, mm -hmm. even, I mean, that just touched me really strongly the last couple of weeks. So never give up when someone is sick or you're by their side and their eyes are not open and mm -hmm. you don't think they're hearing because they're hearing. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is her name? Myrna? Please? What is the name of this person? Hazel. Hazel. Uh, yes. Okay, Hazel. Hazel. All right, Sheila, you were going to say. Yes, please. So um, that reminds me so much. Brings up a memory of when I was standing at my grandmother's uh, side of bed when she was passing, about to pass away. She was the very last stage. And uh, I said, I wish you get a rabbi. I don't know if I told the story before. I should get a rabbi for her to come. And we called the rabbi and he stood at the side of the bed and he started saying the Shema. But he was saying it very softly and he was not at the head of the bed. And I said to him, Rabbi, could you please get closer to her head? And he said, uh, well, behind her head is the window and I don't want to get between God and her. I said, please, can you get closer to her ear? I started saying the Shema. My grandmother was moving her lips to the Shema. Mm. And then she passed. Wow. Mm. Oh, amen. Wow. That uh, proves what you have to say. Mm, they do hear. You Lord. have to be very careful what you say around people that you don't think they can hear you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Abba, we just come before you right now, Lord. We pray for Hazel. Lord, we pray for her hearing, Lord, as we know, as Susan just said, that the Lord can transmit his signal. He is a supernatural wonder working God. Amen. Absolutely. So we pray for her. We pray for her ability to hear. She may be 81, but Lord, she can hear you. Mm. Okay. And she can feel you. Mm. So we just praise you and thank you for what you're going to do with Hazel right now so that she can continue to hear the word of God. Amen. So we praise you and thank you. And we thank you for Myrna for being instrumental in that situation and being an encourager. Amen. And we praise you and we thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen, amen, and amen. amen. All right. Chuck. Let me just raise oh, my hand. Okay. All right. So question one. What lesson was most ingrained in you by your mother or father? And how does your life show their influence today? Some of us have to reflect back. Okay, I look at pictures of my parents, you know, and I just kind of see them at times imparting things to me. Okay, they were quite remarkable. Chuck, go ahead. Well, I grew up in a home where we didn't have God and we didn't have uh, any knowledge of God and we really never prayed, but I did uh, get some of the precepts of God. And the one lesson that stays on my mind uh, often and really applies now as a Christian uh, for all these years uh, is my father used to remind me when I would stumble along the way and make stupid mistakes um, out in the public, whether it was trying to shoplift a popsicle for a friend of mine or whatever, uh, that I was carrying around the family name. And uh, it was a very powerful, powerful lesson to learn uh, as to why I should not just run by the seat of my pants all the time, because the ramifications weren't just on me, they were on the family. And I feel the same exact way when uh, I pray the Lord's model prayer, you know, uh, 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We carry, I carry that name around. And so uh, that's the one lesson that my parents, I believe, taught me that uh, God continues to teach me. You know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I, I say it all the time. And I talk to my friends and to you guys. We're Christians. We carry the name of God as our last name. Amen. He's our father. He's our father. So we don't, um, we should realize how important it is to not mess around with the family name. Amen. Who else? Who else would like to talk about your parents and what they may have ingrained within you? How does your life show that influence today? Well, for me, it, it's kind of a bittersweet thing. It was um, it, the quote that my mother used um, a long time ago, and you'll hear, you'll hear the bittersweet part. Her comment was, the reason you should go to school or get your degree, that was, this was her reason for having me get a degree. She's like, when you marry a fool and he leaves you, you'll be able to take care of yourself. <laughs> now, not a blessing by any stretch. <laughs> and like when, and I, I, when I was in counseling at one point in my life and I said that her eyes got this big, like, oh my goodness, that was not positive. So, um, so it created self-doubt. I, for the longest time, it took a, I didn't trust my own decisions, but then it made me, remember that I can only trust them if they were from God or from godly sources. So it made me think about where I get my counsel, think about how to be wise and not be marrying a fool. Um, and then there's no gear. I mean, in the same counseling sessions, there's no, because you're both Christians, your part, your ways won't part. I just assumed if you're both Christians, there won't be a divorce. It's, she's like, uh-uh two humans are getting together. <laughs> so she says, so calm down about that. I'm like, okay. So anybody can leave anybody. So it's like, okay, be able to stand on your own. That was the pearl <laughs> in all of that muck. <laughs> that was the pearl. So like I said, it was bittersweet, but did it stick for a long time? Yes, it did. <laughs> Amen. So, I would like to say so me, just, uh, just as a uh, as a as a, a caveat on top of that, you uh, to, to to quote a phrase, you became a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech and a hell of an engineer. <laughs> right, rambling tech. All right, Arturo. Yes, Rabbi. For me, um, I guess uh, service. Um, I was raised pretty Catholic, you know, uh, cradle Catholic. Uh, you know, started serving the church from like what fourth grade all the way into adulthood, became a knight of Columbus. I think the one thing for me um, was uh, was service. You know, I always felt like I wanted to build the church or help the church. You know, uh, you know, um, and I got that from them because they were, uh, you know, they were very Catholic. My grandparents, my parents, um, so I got that from them, um, wanting to serve always wanting to serve and not to get anything from it, but just to serve, right. You know, if the father needed, you know, if the, the priest needed something, you know, you, you help them, you know, you serve the altar, you, 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 you know, you light the lights, you, you do whatever you can do. Um, you know, uh, I so think just out of curiosity, now that they see their son wearing a kippah mm -hmm. and a, and she mm -hmm. Okay. What are the comments on that? Well, um, you know, um, my mom is, uh, my mom is very, uh, she's very open to it, um, uh, because she knows that, uh, I was always searching. She's known that since my whole life, I was always searching, right? I mean, 18, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go, you know, serve the church, you know, on a, a full-time basis or go away to a normal school. So, I've always been searching. So I think that this is, it was a natural progression for me. And then, you know, as more, as far as I learned more about my grandfather's side from uh, Brazil, I've learned more about, you know, uh, some Jewish ancestry that we have there. So I think it was a natural progression for me. It was just natural. And, and 
uh, Adonai has put me on this path, you know, so I just, I just keep walking every day, you know, and, uh, and serve. That's it. You know, Amen. sometimes it's hard to explain to a Catholic as I can tell you experience with my, with my, with Susan's parents. Right. Is that Jesus wore a kippah mm -hmm. and had mm -hmm. seat, the fringe hanging from his prayer shawl. Right. Amen. Amen. But you know, the one thing about, you know, that's going to be one of my areas of focus as well as I learn more about, yeah. uh, as more, as like, as more, as I learn more about Yeshua, as opposed to Jesus, when I learn more about Yeshua, I feel like I'm going to be able to bridge some gaps, because I feel like Catholics on a whole want to do more, you know, they want to serve more. And, you know, I know there's a lot of ritualistic things that have been added in Catholicism. And, you know, uh, Catholics just follow it. But if you were if they were taught the stuff of the Old Testament, they would follow that just as easily as well. It's Catholics want to follow. I mean, that's what they're bred into from the beginning. They want to believe everything that comes out of the, the rabbi, the priest's mouth, and they want to follow and serve. Most well, and again, that was a precept from the Catholic Church in as much as it was only the priest who was supposed to know this stuff. Okay, you're not supposed to study the word of God. The priests are supposed to impart that to you. Yeah, which okay. doesn't really happen, does it? I mean, yeah, so yeah, again, it's, really, it's really not, not the best. <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and that's where, like with my family, that's where that, that wanting to serve, you know, bringing up the Eucharist and the gifts and serving with the mass and all that, yeah. that, as you said, is so inbred. But unfortunately, because they're not studying the whole Bible, they believe, and I'm speaking from personal experience, that that's how you get into heaven. Mm -hmm. Because you've done all these good works and you've served in the church and that's all you need to do. To get into heaven and as we know that is not that is not the way that's true chuck chuck sorry well um let me just add that i i had very you know, remember i i went into the mission field when i was 53 and we get called to italy right and i'm living near and working in rome for eight or nine years and uh, i went with some preconceived ideas because i was born and raised and uh, lived as a catholic for over 40 years and um so I had preconceived ideas about it, but I learned a lot about the Catholic Church and the heart that Arturo has brought up. Um, you know, we we can be very very critical ourselves of of uh, religious groups, uh, which usually is a big mistake. Uh, because I know one thing I, I've shared it before. Pope John Paul put up big billboards uh, by San Giovanni, the biggest church in Rome, uh, that stated during this jubilee year that they were celebrating, uh, a year where the public was coming to Rome to receive this plenary indulgences, forgiveness of all their past sin. They were under the impression that you could go through these holy doors and receive the, your forgiveness. And Pope John Paul put up billboards in various languages by San Giovanni that stated clearly the holy door is only an outward evidence of an inward decision that you have made to accept Christ as your savior. Now, they may think that you have to work your way in, and many of them do think that, and the religion has added, like Arturo said, many things that uh, we would be uh, very uh, maybe opposed to or want to debate, but I know this. They have a function that they are showing to the world, at least about one segment of humanity, that is living a very unhuman, uncivilized life. And that's with life. And the Catholic Church has been willing to take a godly stand for life. Thank God for at least that part. And, the, and I'll tell you another thing that I learned uh, was Catholics in general, like Christians in general, Muslims in general, Buddhists in general, are nominal. Everyone is nominal unless you do what we're doing and really seek to know better and have that real desire to allow him to be your God, your savior, your friend, your Lord, and all these other things. But the Catholic church in Rome, in Italy, has an extreme number percentage of people who want to follow Jesus, like Arturo said. They, they, they make, 
have different ways of going about it through the saints, this and that. But their desire in their hearts, I know, is to follow God. I won't go any further with that. I'll just say, I know that uh, God is after the heart. And the heart that I saw of the Catholics in Rome, and I worked mainly with evangelicals, but I was uh, always intertwining with uh, the Catholic Church. We stayed in convents. We fell in love with uh, nuns and priests that fell in love with us. They're our friends to this day. Uh, and I know that we're going to all be in heaven together. Uh, the heart is uh, very much for God in so much of Catholics around the world. They're the not church, a religion as much as we may think they are. Uh, is, many are, but I think a great number is after that relationship that uh, we enjoy. In, in spirit, I agree with you, Chuck. Okay, but the church maintains uh, a re major responsibility for the things that are not true that may be through the indoctrination of the church. I mean, the, the thing that comes to mind is that the church endorsed somebody named Adolf Hitler. To this day, he has never been excommunicated. Okay, the church, it wasn't until 1965 that the church taught that the Jews killed Christ. That is just, we know, not true. Okay, you and I killed Christ. Okay, so um, again, there are a lot of misdeeds that were happening via the church, and the church needs to take the responsibility for some of those things. But in heart, yes, I mean, we know, uh, I mean, look, the Lord spoke to me in the Catholic Church. I've explained, I used to go to Susan's church with her, with her family, and the, the the priest stood up there and said, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, might as well have picked up a javelin and thrown it between my eyes. So he'll get you no matter where you are, no matter what you see. Okay, okay, he'll use whatever situation he can. Chuck. I, I agree. And and I'll just share some other things that I saw because I have to leave and mm -hmm. I really I like this conversation. But uh, until... 19 or until 1850 1875 the catholic church was killing evangelicals who were trying to come into the country to bring the gospel message uh, uh, people from the church let's say and from probably from the vatican and they never apologized to the evangelicals so the evangelicals in italy don't believe you can be a, a catholic and uh, have a relationship with god because they never apologized but that isn't the Catholic, the Catholic Church is like the body of Christ in many ways, in that it's made up of people, millions and millions of people. And for the most part, just like anybody, they can be deceived be like the Jehovah's Witnesses. But the Jehovah's Witnesses' main draw to try to get people to come in is let's study the Bible together. So people from every possible walk of life that do join them, join them because they want to study the Bible together. And I've met many and become good friends with uh, many that told me this and shared that, that about the church and the religion. Uh, I'm not standing up for the Vatican uh, because there are many, many flaws, but there's many flaws. Gosh, there's too many flaws in the oh, I mean, Because of human I beings. With you. I, mean, I read something the other day no, it's not. And I'm getting, and I'm going to go, and I I'll let you guys go. But I read something the other day about a pastor in a church somewhere, an evangelical church. It so disturbed me once again that I just cried. I just thought, how can you do this? How can you possibly do this for years and years and years, and yet go up in that pulpit every week and proclaim? God, the harm seems so huge, but God is bigger than all the harm, all the false proclamations, all of all these other things. And so what I say is that God in his infinite love for mankind, even though churches, pastors, religions screw it up so badly that he can show himself to us and reveal that, that holy, give us that Holy Spirit to guide us in a walk of abundant, real, purposeful life and ultimately life with him in heaven. So 
<laughs> I know that's a lot. I love you guys, and I got to go. Lost you, Chuck. Lost you. You're, God you bless you all. See you next week. All right, buddy. God bless you. Thanks, Chuck. Okay. Myrna, you're muted. You're muted. Unmute me. You're on. You're muted. You're okay. Well, you were. Speak. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was thinking that um, what I learned uh, as a little one growing up in the Curry family and Mitchell learned family was important to God and we could pray together and we could sing together. And one of the things that my father in particular and my grandfather from the mother's maternal side would show for their, their responsibility to taking care of the family. Um, so every week I would go to see my grandfather and he would say, take this for your mother and take this for you all. And it was just something that was very ingrained in us. You know, like my mother, she, she could have a, her sister's hat wearing her sister's hat over a week. And then it was just one thing that I remember strongly that we cared for one another and for the neighbors and for other people, family being very important, faith important. And they allowed me to wake them up early to pray. Uh, and my daddy later on would say, you're like Moses. I, I am enriched. And my dad would always say, take this banana or yam or whatever it is to these teachers or the, or the, um, the doctor in the area. And I said, they can't buy it. Yes, they can, but they are strangers and we need, they, they don't plant things so we can give it to them rather than sell it to them. And a mango tree in the center of our property called the pastor by a mango tree. So many basics I have learned and I thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Again, uh, when we recite, we all stand up in the synagogue during the liturgy and we face east. And what do we recite? The Shema. The Shema. 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 Okay. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one when we face east. Because that Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, is key to all of Scripture. All of Scripture. And in yeah. the mezuzah that people put on the doorpost of their house, as we are commanded to do during that time, you know, you write the word, put it on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Okay, the mezuzah is what you kiss when you go in the house and you kiss when you leave the house. Okay, but right after we recite that, we say another verse together from Leviticus. Not a verse, just a phrase. Who's got it? Equally as important as the first and greatest commandment. It's equally as important. We say, Love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you, Bo. Okay. Wraps up everything. And that's what Myrna was just talking about. Okay. And that's what most of us are saying. And if, the, if your parents taught you that, okay, praise God. Let's read. I mean, Rabbi, you'll, Rabbi, you'll appreciate this. We grew up, we were Germans that went to Roman Catholic Church in a Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. Oh um, my God. Okay, <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> and and the, uh, God certainly has a, a uh, sense of humor. But the one thing that, that uh, my parents and my dad, for, who was always a curious man, was always curious about how the Jews were following. And, but one thing he never did, he never let somebody that needed help go by. And that was his, uh, he died two years ago. And even to this day, I cross people that say, your dad was always there, you know, was always one of those reliability issues or whatever you want to call about. Maybe he was just a guy that, that grew up that way. And hopefully that, that's infused in me as well. But that's, uh, he lived that way. And I remember as a child, didn't matter if a pipe broke in the middle of the night, it didn't matter if you were a Jew or Gentile, it didn't matter at that point. Just on, just on the weekend, it was a little different. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is between Saturday and Sunday, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. Um, you're, you're breaking up on us. Say, can you hear me? Yes. Still can't hear me? Okay, go no. ahead. 
Yes. There's many things I can say about my bringing up, especially through my mom. Um, mostly, you know, the hospitality, the gift of faith, praying for people, personal altering. Um, she said, <laughs> Bo, when yes. you sometimes you, you hold still because when you move around, the, the sound breaks up. Sorry. And she used to say, because her, um, her father and mother, she was the 12th child and they adopted two other kids. And she used to say, we didn't know we were poor. We give everything. We always took care of everybody. We never knew we were poor. You lost me again? Yeah, but the sound the sound goes sideways. Uh, oh, one, you know what? I figured out what it was. It's like some kind of interference. Better? Is that better? No? Go ahead. Go ahead. So what I was saying was, there's a lot I could say, mostly on my mom's side. Um, Seth and her mother's name was Zilla. And they had 12 kids. My mom was the 12th child. And they also adopted two kids. So my mom was helping people. She didn't have a poor mentality. She said, oh, we, I didn't know we were poor growing up. We took care of everybody. <laughs> so mostly hospitality. Uh, she, she, she liked the prayer altar in the house. And... Um, about Jesus kind of stuff. Um, just Amen. a jewel of a jewel of Amen. Thank you, Bo. Okay, let's do this. Let's uh, jump over to First Thessalonians chapter three, verse one through thirteen. The discussion is joyous. And, and revelational, and I cannot tell you how wonderful it is. Rebecca, you doing okay over there? Amen. All right. All right, so who would like to read for us? Uh, again? First, Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, what again, Rabbi? 1 through 13. Chapter 3. Yes, chapter 3. Okay. Uh, but we will start actually... Start on verse four. Start on verse four. Would like to read for us. Chapter of verse four. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse four. For even when we were with you we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer persecution you know what bo you're you're breaking up on us so i don't know what it is it sounds like this um, in, like electronic interference okay um okay, okay who else has got it okay okay diane you. starting at verse four Yes. For even when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer persecution, just as has happened, as you know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faithfulness for fear that the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might have been in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us, from you and brought us the good news of your faithfulness and love and that you always have good memories of us longing to see us just as we long to see you because okay. of this but you want to stop there uh yeah verse the end of uh five okay okay all right so uh, again i want you to keep in mind please a list of words and phrases in what we're reading that reveal an intense emotion at work in Paul. Okay, Rav Shaul, Rabbi Paul. All right, so 
again, for what we just read, is there anything there when I could no longer stand it? I also sent him to find out about your faith, fearing that the tempter had attempted you. Does that not happen? Okay, when you are trying to disciple somebody, okay, and you and you, from what they may have ever experienced or expressed to you initially as to why they weren't already there, what kinds of things interfere with that? Okay, and what are your concerns for that person? Would you not want to check up on the spiritual health of that person? Okay, let's jump over and verse read again, uh, Diane 6 and 7. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us the good news of your faithfulness and love, and that you always have good memories of us, longing to see us just as we long to see you, because of this, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and trouble, we were comforted about you by your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Again, if you're sharing your faith with somebody, would you not want to check in on them periodically to check their spiritual temperature? Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. So what is what what is, what do you, what words here to express intense concern on Paul's part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, faith. Yeah, what does it say in verse seven? We were well, comforted about you by your faithfulness. Okay, it says in all our distress. Yes. Mm -hmm. Affliction. Mm. Okay, they were being persecuted. Well, we were encouraged to know that you're staying strong in the faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, uh, Timothy noted that they, they treasured good memories of Paul and his companions and the Thessalonians' yeah. recollection of the apostles were pleasant. So in, in the word therefore here usually serves as a thought uh, or, or a connector. Mm -hmm. Susan. So maybe I have a slightly different perspective that I see in here, which is very interesting to me. Um, isn't it interesting that the concern was so severe and there was fear? They were, he was afraid. And yet what he was afraid of was not at all what was going on, right? Right. So he had that, it, it's just always an interesting thing. God is not what giving was, us- What were they afraid of? What was- he, Paul, Paul was afraid that they had fallen away that the okay. work was unfruitful, that they weren't standing. Well, what fact, else, what else could they be afraid of? No, it was persecution. Yeah. Well, but that isn't what he's saying. It's, he's right. going to be, you know, he's being persecuted, you know, yep. and he's being tormented, no question. But in addition to his real circumstances, he has this tremendous fear that something is wrong with them. Interestingly, what was actually going on with them was very different than what he was afraid of. I just, just to say that it's interesting <clears throat> sometimes that the Lord can put something on our heart so that we pray and intercede. That is always excellent. But the fear part of it separate it and put it in the garbage. There is the fear of the Lord and then there is the spirit or personality of fear. And the personality of fear manifests here as torment. That is the biblical verse. Fear hath torment. And that is the spirit of fear. And in all things to be able to take out the kernel, yes, pray and intercede. And I believe his prayers and intercession supported what came about as a good report. Okay. Amen. And Nothing is, is going on about, about that fear. You know, one of the uh, many years ago, we had a friend that used to say, Imagine there's a flusher here on the side of your head. Okay. 
there are certain things that, that bother us that shouldn't bother us at all. And if it does, write it down on a piece of paper, tear it up, and put it in the, the commode and flush it. Amen? It's just yeah. no it's need a lie. those things. And when you look up by, back on it, the Lord dealt with it as he, as we, that's why we have faith. Amen? Amen. All right, let's read 8 and 10, please. Mm. For now we live since you're standing firm in, in the Lord. For what thanks would be enough to offer to God in return for all the joy we feel before our God because of you? Now, nighttime and daytime, we keep praying more than ever for you to see your face, to see you face to face and mend any shortcomings in your faith. Okay. <laughs> Again, we're looking for his concern, his deep concern. Okay, as we pray earnestly, day, night, and day to see. Yeah. Verna, go ahead. Verna? Yeah. Yes. Um, the yearning I was having for Susan, I was going to check um, Susan again to say, I haven't seen or heard from Susan. And is, is it well with her? Send me her number. And, and, and I'm so grateful that she was on and is on. Hi, Suzanne. Be blessed. You're talking about Susan Kornfeld or Susan Gaines? Yes, yes, Susan Gorsley. Susan Kornfeld. Susan Gaines yeah. is always faithful and here. We so. are, we hallelujah to that. <laughs> Blessings on you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank I'm you going to be leaving to downtown, down, sir, downstairs now. Blessings all. Have a wonderful day. Remember all the things that God wants us to remember. Give him glory. Thank you. Thank you, Myrna. Thank you for being with us. Yes. All right. We love you. And thank you. Bless the Lord. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. By mentioning what may be lacking, Paul yeah. was not I'm questioning. Really, really thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Yeah, you have done so much for me. You have done so much. Yes. Hang on. Okay. Uh, again. Uh, the Greek wording implies the, a desire to strengthen and improve their spiritual condition, not giving them something that was being held back or missing. Uh, the believer's life is an ongoing process, amen, it's called sanctification. And uh, the believers are called to become more like Yeshua every day every day and as such what is lacking should be understood in terms of discipleship the thessalonians salvation uh was secure but paul couldn't help could help he could help them absolutely uh to conform to conform more closely to the image of yeshua amen amen so keeping all of that in mind what practical steps can you take to encourage another believer this week? Why it is it important for believers to rejuvenate one another? And is that what we're doing here? Mm -hmm. I'm talking yes. about the work that Yeshua is, that Jesus is doing in our lives right now? Yes. yes. Amen? Amen. Okay, so anything else that you can think of that we could do, if you have somebody you know somebody else who's a believer and who may be discouraged by something, okay? How could you step in and, and help uh, rejuvenate their faith? Pray for them and pray with them if we can. Mm -hmm. Yes. Read from the word of God, amen? Uh, I mean, amen. Rabbi, I think sometimes just being in... Sometimes someone just needs a good listener. 
you know, to sometimes just be a sounding board for them, you know, while they're going through different things and uh, different difficulties in their life. Sometimes it's just as simple as being an ear, a concerned ear to listen. Um, sometimes God will put something in your heart that can help them, you know. Amen. But again, as was just mentioned, that prayer is the greatest weapon that you could have in your arsenal. Amen. I mean, just like we were talking about earlier, that, you know, when, like when Chuck said to the waiter, the bus boy, whatever it was, can we pray for you? Hey, absolutely extraordinary. Bo, what were you going to say? I was just going to say also with that or second to that, I don't know. Um, if you get a scripture or know a scripture after you pray with them, you can encourage them to keep reading that scripture out loud to themselves because the word of God is a lie. Amen. They read that word, that word gets more instilled in them and they get to see, wow, it's more powerful when I speak the word to myself than when you speak the word to me. Amen. 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 Susan, you're muted. Just a quick thought, I think that maybe ties a couple of things in together with in terms of uh, the prayer and Arturo saying about an ear, um, a, a listening ear. I think it's interesting sometimes that the ability to prayerfully listen and then as you hear to take that and bring it before the throne, either to pray with the person. That's an amazing thing to, as you were repeating what Chuck had said, that um, hearing in the spirit and listening and asking and then being able to pray and to give scriptures. To, it, it's just so much the fullness of God's provision, right? And Amen. sometimes we simply have to we don't have those other opportunities, but as Diane said, the prayer, you know, so it's wonderful to be able to, to listen. Just the mere fact that you offer to pray for somebody implies that you have a belief in a, in a relationship with God. Amen. And, and that is that, so missing. But and that you're willing to hear what they need. Exactly. People, go through life you know people say how are you they are not the least bit interested in finding out how you are and you figure that out and you just say i'm fine everything is great and people don't expect someone to actually especially you know they don't want they don't expect anyone to listen to care how they are or what they need yep. that's just not expected huh? exactly Diane, would you read 11 through 13? Now may our God and Father himself and Yeshua our Lord direct our way to you. May the Lord also cause you to increase and overflow in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, in order to strengthen your hearts as blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Yeshua, with all his Kiddushim. Amen. All right. With all his holy ones, all his saints. Amen. So, uh, you know, the, the hope of his return. Kalita, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Back when you were um, talking about ways to encourage, I, the other thing that's a, a quick encouragement is through text. Um, just one of my sisters, you know, just a little while ago was thinking of something that she heard me say and sent me a text with the referral for something that I could see to read more about it. So, I mean, so our technology allows us to send quick encouragements like that. So just appreciating that, that people are, are doing that for each other. And like I said, it's, it was a quick thing, but it was sweet. So you can be just that quick, a quick text. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. So the hope of his return provided motivation for Paul's prayers and for the Thess Thessalonians' 
spiritual growth. So on that day of our sanctification, that will be the com- it will be complete that we that we stand before Mashiach, Messiah. Amen. Amen. And uh, Paul envisioned presenting those who had believed in Bessara, the good news, uh, the talking about uh, coming back to Yeshua at the coming of our Lord. Okay, he's talking about the revelation of that and the fact that it's actually happening. When that happened, he didn't want to be ashamed of the choices that they had made. And he didn't want them to be ashamed either. He didn't want to be ashamed. He didn't want them to be ashamed of the good news. Thus, he challenged them to continue to follow Christ and living in the way that God found acceptable. Okay, that's why what we read at the beginning, at the end of Leviticus, was so important. Amen? If then, if you do this, then this is what you're going to have. Amen? So, you know, again, it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to live it and do it and communicate it to somebody else. So when we listen to Paul's prayer, what part of the prayer would you most like to see perfected in your life? He said, and may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone, just as we do for you. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness and before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That's quite a prayer. Diane. I would like for him to perfect my love for all people because I do tend to have some prejudices against certain individuals. Um, And I had, I had to pray a lot during that service yesterday because of someone who I felt like had a lot of nerve showing up, but um, I I really, I, you know, I kept telling myself and God kept telling me, you're not perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, your sins are just as bad as that individual's. Wow. So, you know, if he can forgive me, he can forgive him. Yeah, but I, I, I prayed for a change in my heart that way and yeah. a change of this person's heart in another way. So. Amen. And, and I'll just add on to that rather than go, go into a long thing. Sometimes that's why the Lord put, puts people there. Like you just said, to remind you, when you say, yes. why is this person here? This, this person shouldn't be here. That was to remind you, me, and a bunch of other people the same thing. I believe. Yeah. Really yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Okay, and that's why the this is on the doorpost of your house, so that when you kiss it, when you leave it, you can remember to whom you belong. And when you come back into the house and you kiss it again, you can remember to whom you belong. Amen. 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 Comments. Attractions, prayer requests. Okay. We've gathered to worship here in the house of the risen sun.